The scripture reading today comes to us from the book of Colossians, and it's Paul's letter to the church at, in, of Colossians, of Col Colossae, 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 I think that's right, Nevin? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, the last series was all about the, Paul's letter to the Romans, and this is just another group of people that Paul is trying to encourage. So here we go. This is Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 24. And Paul says this. For this reason, since the day we heard of your love in the Spirit, we have not stopped praying for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom, in all spiritual understanding, so that you may walk in harmony with the Lord, in sync with God, being fruitful in every good work, and as you grow in the knowledge or recognition of God, strengthened with all mastery of God's glory, which glory is just adopting God's imagination or image forming, so that you may have all love, endurance, and patience joyfully giving thanks to God who has enabled us to share in the inheritance of the holy ones in the light. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of God's beloved child in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and unto him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that Christ might come to have first place in everything. For it pleased God that in Christ should all completeness reside, and through Christ God was pleased to reconcile to God's self all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross of Jesus. And you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies, that is, in your own mind, by wicked works, yet now God has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless, blameless and wholly unaccused before God. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, without being moved away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and then jump to verse 26. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made known to God's saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I know it's a lot of words, and it'll be a lot to unpack, but for now, may God bless and challenge us in the reading of this word. Wow. Let me just tell you, I wrote this, and you know, Howard sent me the lyrics to this song probably a couple days, and in all honesty, I didn't open them. I saw the title, and I was like, that'll work. <laughs> but if you followed along with the lyrics, you watch how the Spirit works through and in the lives of the people of this congregation. Here's what I have. We are one. A beautiful reminder of the connectedness we share, the completeness already present in us and around us. Did you know that? That we're already complete. That we are already connected to one another through the spirit of Christ. Did you know that? And I know that sounds idealistic, 
I've been accused of worse, or like something that would happen only if Jesus himself came returning to earth, riding on a white horse through the clouds, would take that kind of miracle, an act of God, that's what it would take at this point to force us to connect, really connect to one another, amen? What would you do if I told you that an act of God already did connect us to one another like that? That no matter what we do, we can't break that connection to and every one and every thing. Ooh, what would the world look like if that were true? Ooh. What would the world look like that if it were true? Much as we say we want unity, we want all to be one. If we're honest, we like our separateness. We may not admit it, we may not admit it even to ourselves, but we like being a little bit different from others. We like to stand out, stand apart a little bit from ourselves, to think of ourselves as right, which of course makes others not as right or even wrong. But either way, I mean, can you picture them agreeing with us or even worse, us agreeing with them? May it never be. I don't know if I ever want to even think about that, but what can I tell you? Like it or not, we are indeed all connected, connected by something greater than you, greater than me, greater than any us that walked the face of the earth, greater than any them that ever threatened the face of the earth. Connected to, as the scripture says, all things, all things, whether on earth or in heaven. That means to other humans, sure, connected, but also to animals and plants, and trees, and rocks, and streams, and rivers, and oceans, and deserts, and mountains, and sky, stars, moons, planets, suns, connected to wind, and dust, and molten lava beneath the surface of the earth, connected to all time, and space, and being, and Christ holding the whole thing together. Now that's powerful. Because, well, that spirit of Christ, Christ holding all things together, all creation, all universe, all space, all time, all dust, all stars, well, that Christ is in us. And that isn't something that will be, that is something that is. God has already done it. Today we begin a new series, Corners of the Mind. And again, I don't know how he does it, but thank you, Dave. A few months ago, I read this phenomenal book called Sand Talk that kind of changed me from the inside out. And I think I've shared it with a couple of you anyway. It's uh, called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World by a man called Tyson Yonkaporta, who is from Australia. He's an Aboriginal person from Australia. In it, he takes the reader on a journey through five minds what he calls minds, or thought patterns that are present in Aboriginal culture that guide indigenous peoples' interactions with themselves, the land, and one another. He describes five ways of thinking, and he names them, and he gives, them, gives us a mnemonic device in order to remember them using our hand. In his version, this, the pinky, then the, the youngest one, would be the child or kinship mind. This next ring, ring finger is story mind. The next one is dreaming mind. The pointer finger is ancestor mind. And the thumb that interacts with all of them is called 
pattern mind. So as I read through his, this journey and descriptions of each one of the five ways of thinking, the relationships and the way the teachings related to the teachings was, of Jesus, to me, was glaringly obvious. And all I thought of was, I got to tell my people this. This is great. I needed to share them with you in the form of a series. But how to do those five minds and how would I twist them to relate them in scripture? How would we be able to then apply them to our faith journey? To me, I understood it. Was it going to be all right with Tyson Yonkaporta? Then, in the next paragraph, he invites us to use them, but don't use them in the way he did. Make them our own. Use them for our own community. Use them for our own growth. Make up our own stuff. So, with the author's permission, I had my work at hand, and I began. So... This is what we're getting for the next five weeks. We're going to be looking at five ways of thinking that can help us both as individuals and a community of faith better focus on the teachings of Christ and learn how to better live them out. You've probably guessed the first one already. Connection, yeah. It's the place that we begin, and you can even use it with your little finger to remember, connection. It's the place we begin because it's the place where everything we are and everything we do begins. Before birth, we're connected, present, even in the genes of our parents and grandparents and so on. Scientific evidence now suggests that whatever they've experienced We've also experienced in some way, shape, or form. And it actually, their experiences mark our genetic code. It's fascinating, actually, really. It even affects our memories. It comes how we remember and know things that we have no business knowing. But beyond genetics, from birth, we are connected. We breathe the same air. We walk the same lands. We share the same waters as those who were here from the beginning. Their dust, as it were. Well, not as it were. Their dust is in our homes. Their dust is in our lungs. But it's not just the elements of the earth that we share. We share a spirit, the same spirit that we just heard in the letter to Colossians that binds and holds all things together. God reconciled everything to God. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That we share all of this matters that we are intrinsically connected to all things and each other. Anything and everything we do affects all things and each other. Can I say that to you again? That we are connected intrinsically to all things and each other. Anything and everything we do affects all things and each other. Now, for most of us, this is not a new concept. And we've discussed it. We've known about this kind of spirit of connection. We talk about it frequently, especially when we talk about the Bantu African origin philosophy of Ubuntu that emphasizes the interconnectedness of all life. Sometimes Ubuntu is translated as, as I am because you are. That's Ubuntu in a nutshell. I am because you are. And it seems like something this basic, as mu this much a part of the core of who would be are, because this is in us, somehow it seems like it must be easier to live out than it is. After all, it's rooted in us, right? It's rooted in us, like you see, even up here with the mushroom. Did you ever hear about mushrooms with the root systems and things and the way they communicate with different species and things like that? That connection is amazing. And that's kind of, that. well, it is in us as well. It's how we communicate with one another. It's who we are. It's in our memories. It's even in how we learn and know and remember things. 
And it's from this connection part of our being that all of our other relationships are born and then develop. But therein lies the rub. Because that means that what we learn early on, even from birth to now, about ourselves, what we learn about our and from our caretakers, our familial units, as well as our earliest experiences of the world, those are what form and shape how we see the world and others. And ultimately, they create something called our social construction of reality, or how we see the world. Sadly, most of us didn't grow up in an ethos of Ubuntu, or am I the only one? We didn't grow up embracing that we are part of a vast and delicately balanced creation that wants and even needs our participation, us, each one of us. Most of us didn't learn that what we do affects everything and everyone, that we are that interconnected. Instead, we were taught to take care of ourselves and take care of our own and make sure we get ours. And it was hard enough for some just navigating our way through the muck of that childhood and coming out on the other side with a shred of self-worth and value. Amen? Let's take us out of there. Even if we were fortunate enough to have an idyllic childhood, I remember meeting with a couple for premarital counseling one time, and the woman said, I had a perfect childhood. It was idyllic. And I just kind of looked at her, I was like, wow. <laughs> but even if we did, the world around us that we live in gave us a different message that we and our world are both broken. And our problems, they are so vast that they are just about short of that miracle, unfixable. And sure, I mean, we can try our best, we can recycle, and we can be kind to animals, and we can bring comfort to the suffering as best we can, but you know what? For the most of us, we seldom reclaim that greater sense of connection within us that continues throughout our lives to groan and yearn for affirmation and embrace within us. Yet should we dare that voice of unity to to have real space in our lives. Do you, ever, do you ever create space for something within yourself or something to happen, just making space? Like, when you make space, you gotta knock down walls, you gotta like get rid of other things, you gotta clear out boxes, you gotta get rid of baggage. Like, creating space for something brand new to take root in us. That will be what ultimately helps us heal the world and heal ourselves. Martin Luther King said it this way, and you read it up there, whatever affects one directly affects all. I can never be what I ought to be unless you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Martin Luther King knew it. The Apostle Paul knew it. He knew it. He's writing to the Colossians that we heard earlier, Jesus knew it as he prayed for us to embrace it in the garden on the night of his betrayal, prayed for us, the glory that you have given me, God, I have given them that they may be one as we are one, intrinsically connected, I in them and you in me, and we completely one. Martin Luther King knew it, the Apostle Paul knew it, Jesus knew it, and honestly, we know it. We know it. At the core of our being, we know that even the most repulsive person we can think of is part of us. Swallow, take a breath. <laughs> We 
We know at the core of our being that every time we say a bad word about someone else, we are also hurting ourselves. That's that little ache that comes in the pit of our stomach when we do it. It reminds us that on some level, we've just damaged some small part of God's creation. Here's the good news, and there's always good news. The thing is, the Colossians were struggling with the very same thing. They're, 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 they, they're trying to figure it all out, just like we're trying to figure it all out. They're just as damaged as we are. They have just as much baggage as we are. They're trying to try to figure out how to live out the teachings of Christ in a world that told them that they weren't connected to anything except the empire and that their allegiance and their loyalty should be to nothing but the empire, and make no mistake, they were just as broken and just as bamboozled and just as confused as most of us. So Paul encourages them, and just is beautiful if you ever read all of Colossians, just on how to resist being swallowed by that empire, to be swallowed by the strength of imperialism and nationalism, and to continue to be followers of the way or follow the teachings of Christ. And he begins the first chapter, and this is why it relates so well to Jan Porta's work, he relates this first chapter with the most basic of truths. We are all connected. And that truth, should the Colossians decide to embrace it and then cultivate it and nurture it and then tell the stories from to our children and reinforce it in their own lives from generation to generation to generation, that's the way those truths become effective. Would it be difficult? Yeah. Yeah. Would it be hard to be the first one in your family, the first one of your friends, the first one in the community or your political party to take a stand and say, I'm not going to harm you anymore. I won't harm you with words, thoughts of my mind, actions of my hands, or judgments of my heart. I refuse. Of course it would be hard. We used to train people with anti-racism. We used to talk especially to the white community and talk to them about the fact that there's always something in the room that we have to get rid of. Part of it is just being as simple as not laughing at racial slurs, racial jokes, and not tolerating it. And being the one in the room when a joke is told to say, I don't find that funny. And that's not being mean. That's standing for something. That's embracing the connectedness of a people of God. That's, create, that's embracing the connectedness with us and all of creation. So yeah, it it, it's going to be hard, so we have a choice. Every day we have a choice. We stand or not. We embrace who we are and that our actions really mean something and affect something or not. Here's what I know. It's just as hard, like as hard as it is to take a stand, it's just as hard once you know the truth once you are in the knowledge of God, to let those things slide. Difficult to live out the teachings of Christ. Difficult not to live out the teachings of Christ. Pick your difficult. Paul's prayer was that people might be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, meaning that we know God's desires for us. We know God's desires for us, yes? 
that we can walk in harmony, in sync with God, one with God. What does that feel like? If you've experienced it for three minutes in your lifetime, what does it feel like to be in sync with God? Paul says that they could be strengthened with all the mastery of God's glory. And I told you during the reading, glory, doxa, that word doxa, it means adopting God's imagination. In other words, adopting God's thought patterns, God's way of thinking about creation and us. What does God think about us? Please tell me you know. Give it to me. Love. How does God see us? Perfect, holy, righteous, pure. That's how we are to see every living thing, every part of creation. Loved, pure, holy, righteous, perfect, untainted. And the beautiful thing is, when we do, we're enabled then to live and be inheritors with the saints or the holy ones as children of light. If you take one thing away from today, one thing, it's that you are a light being. I don't care what you weigh. You are a light being. You are filled with light. Light oozes from you. It's a very different way of looking at ourselves than we're taught, but this is where we get to practice. Before we leave here today, tell three people, wow, your light is shining. Wow, you are a child of light. Think of something with light with that person that you see in them, because you know what? That's how we get to know one another as well. That's how I know God. I see Elizabeth's light, so I know God better through Elizabeth. I see it with Lois. I see it with each one of you when I look at you and act with you and know you better. When our relationship grows, my relationship with God just gets wider and bigger than ever before. I learn from you every day. I cherish that I learn from you every single day. We are a privileged. I, I don't know how to describe us. We are so freaking lucky to be with each other. And to be in a community where we can nurture and love and grow our relationship and encourage each other to be the light that is in us. Live it. God bless you.